Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk on our paper, High Performance Design Patterns and File Formats for Side Channel Analysis. This is a joint work between myself, Stefan Ean, Peter Baumgunther, and Vincent Immler. Now, let's get started. If you're familiar with side channel analysis, then you probably ran into this situation before. You're running an SNR or TVLA algorithm, and it's taking longer than you'd like. So you open your resource monitor and see that your CPU is not being utilized at 100%, but you're not sure why. Well, this can lead to a few common misconceptions. The first being, I need to upgrade my CPU. Well, I don't think this will actually help you as much as you like if you're not currently utilizing your CPU at 100% of its capacity. Okay, well, maybe I need to upgrade to or get a faster SSD. Well, actually compare it to your cache and CPU, SSDs are quite slow. So this, again, would not help you as much as you'd like. Well, do I have to read my data through f.read? No, you do not. But no matter how you're running your I.O., if it is being done serially, it's blocking your computations. Let me show you what I mean. This is a thread time profile of R framework SCAR doing a TVLA analysis. Now SCAR is written entirely in Python, but as you can see here, we have two threads doing a parallel read that are quite busy. Well, there are many compute threads that are only doing intermittent work in short bursts. This means that we would not really benefit from rewriting all of our code in another language such as Rust that is more compute oriented, as f.read is a system level call and a system level call will not be faster regardless of the language that you're using. It is also important to remember here that as you increase your I.O. complexity doing something such as trace indexing, this problem will actually only begin to get worse. So let's talk about what the real underlying problem is here. As you can see, this is a graph showing normalized scaling of compute and compute performance and interconnect bandwidth speeds. As you can see, the compute performance is growing at a much faster rate than that of the bandwidth speed. This is due to CPUs and GPUs getting increases in performance due to things such as adding cores, which doesn't really benefit speed that much for memory. This creates a gap in these two metrics known as the memory wall. And the consequence of this memory wall is that computing faster is now relative if you're not getting your data fast enough. In order to begin to overcome the memory wall, we have to somehow decrease the amount of data that we need to transfer. But first, before we get to that, we have to talk about what data are we actually using for side channel analysis. Now this is decided by the oscilloscope that you use. And modern oscilloscopes typically store and transfer data in a short integer, which takes up 16 bit of bits of space. However, true ADC bits are typically less than this. For example, if you're using a key side oscilloscope, it's a 10-bit ADC, which results in you having a 37.5% overhead. Or if you use a LaCroix oscilloscope, that has a 12-bit ADC, resulting in you having a 25% overhead. This means that you're wasting storage space on your disk and I.O. bandwidth during your computes. This made us ask the question if lossless compression could actually help us make our computations faster in these cases. Which brings me to our work. Now, current commercial side channel analysis frameworks are not sustainable in academia environments due to the grant processes. And also, previous community efforts in this space were based off synthetic benchmarks that did not consider I.O. behaviors. Also, optimized algorithms are essential to accurately assess our research. The challenges we chose to face for our paper were to find the best file format for high performance and functionality, as well as to maximize performance and overcome previous I.O. burdens. We also wanted to fairly compare our results against more mature side channel analysis frameworks, including their I.O. behaviors. As a result, I present to you today a comprehensive study of different side channel analysis file formats, our framework, SCAR, which is optimized for lossless compressed data, as well as a microarchitecture analysis and benchmarking of SCARED, LASCAR, and SCAR. The result of this is that SCAR is twice as fast while requiring half of the storage space of these other frameworks. Now, while we were doing research and development for SCAR, we found many good papers out there. These papers focused more on algorithmic optimizations to reduce instructions. However, this approach is assuming the availability of the data and does not account for the gap between instructions that I just demonstrated earlier. They also focused heavily on one-pass processing, which gave us the general assumption that out-of-core out computing is a requirement of these frameworks, as your data set is usually far greater than your available memory. What we found missing from these papers is that instruction-level optimizations do not account for the CPU or buffer cache, that high-performance computing patterns for cache optimizations um, such as loop blocking and data locality were not discussed in the papers. On top of this, microarchitecture analysis was not done, leading to an unknown status of the code optimizations that had, they had done. And also, they did not have benchmarkings included, such as 
um, indexing needed for point and trace of interest selections. Which leads me to our first design choice for SCAR, which is the file format. Now there are a lot of file formats out there and is an understandably hotly debated topic. We cover the conceptual differences in our paper and how they can be accessed in Python. Today I'm going to be presenting to you two file formats. The first is HDF5, which is the most popular choice for Python frameworks, and ZAR, which is SCAR's choice. Now HDF5 has its own lock, which means you cannot do parallel read. However, it has passed the test of time and is widely adopted due to its fast sequential read without chunking. Unfortunately, HDF5 has poor fancy indexing for rinse and a limited range of compression options. While ZAR, which is SCAR choice, has true parallel read to avoid I.O. blocking. It is relatively new and community powered, and it is lightweight using operating system level mechanisms, and has a wide range of compression algorithms thanks to its native BLOSC support. This led us to choose ZAR due to its benefits of true parallel read, compression, and its cloud native format, which allows for deep learning at scale and clustered computing. For SCAR, we wanted to stick with Python and use NumPy and Numba to optimize our core functionality. We also wanted, thanks to our use of ZAR, to have true parallel read to support the processing of EM tiles without blocking. You can see here a diagram which shows our multiprocessing architecture in SCAR. As you can see, we are spawning a separate Python process for each EM tile. And also, for each batch of data, we are processing our columns in parallel using threading, updating our metrics as we go. We are also hiding our I.O. latency by doing an asynchronous prefetch of our next batch using the Asyncio library. This allows us to have the principle that if our compute is greater than our I.O. cost, then our I.O. should be free. We are also designing while being very wary of the Python global interpreter, walk, global interpreter lock, carefully working around it so as not to block our computations while we are reading. When we chose to benchmark SCAR, we wanted to select some tough competitors to compare ourselves against. The first was LASCAR, which is a mature side channel analysis framework by Ledger, and SCARED, which is a minimalist open source version of the commercial framework ES Dynamic by eShard. The rationale for why we chose these frameworks is explained in our paper, but we apologize if we did not test yours. For data sets, we have an uncompressed data set that used, was recorded using a 12-bit ADC. It is 100,000 traces long with a 70,000 point sample length. And then we have a compressed version of the same data set, which resulted in about a 50% file reduction thanks to the LZ4HC compression algorithm. It is important to note here that decompression time for LZ4 compression algorithms is actually the same regardless of the compression level that you're using here. We also used many analysis tools while developing and benchmarking SCAR. We used Intel VTune for microarchitecture analysis. We had used VMTouch to evict our buffer caches, which ensured true one-pass processing as well as many additional scripts to support our automation. We did our best here to do a fair analysis of these frameworks, but there are potential limitations that we have also listed in our paper. This is a top-down microarchitecture performance analysis of all three frameworks. Now, if you see a framework missing from our charts, that is because they either did not support the algorithm or we could not get their code completed in a way that allowed us to produce good results. Now here you can see that what you want on these charts is the green. This means that the restrictions are in retiring, which means they are basically unimpeded during their lifetime. And what you really do not want to see is yellow. This is bad speculation, which is the worst kind of impedance that you can see for these analysis. Now SNR is very difficult to optimize, and as you can see, all three frameworks are doing the best that they can, only resulting in about a 40% retiring rate at the peak for SCAR. This is because it has a difficult memory access pattern that is very particular, so you are kind of limited in the ways that you can uh, speed up your code. Now, for CPA, you can see here that SCAR has done a great job reducing the bad speculation significantly compared to SCARED uh, and greatly increasing the retiring rate. This is because CPA is, in essence, a matrix multiplication problem and highly memory bandwidth dependent. Now, SCAR is doing this by having data types and structures that are very, that are very friendly to NumPy's Fortran backend, uh, which is something that SCARED actually also does. But what SCAR is doing is that they are not multiprocessing across the byte positions of AES. We actually have a 3D data set that we're then using NumPy to efficiently compute along the uh, byte position axis, and then we are flattening that to take advantage of the NumPy backend. 
For MIA, which is all about building histograms, SCAR has done a significant work here to greatly increase the percentage of retiring by reducing the bad speculation again. This is because histograms can be highly cache optimized. Now, SCAR is doing this through data locality. I did talk to eShard about this yesterday, and they said that they did not think that they could take advantage of this as they think the memory requirements would be too high for certain encryption algorithms that they would like to attack. Um, in this case, I would suggest something such as loop blocking, which is another cache optimization where you could, again, reduce the bad speculation that you're seeing here when trying to build histograms. The results that you're seeing here today were mainly achieved through iterative analysis using VTune, as well as many code improvements. Now let's get on to our benchmark results. As you can see here, our benchmark results are in runtime in seconds for across many different algorithms. This is the benchmark for the first profile, which is targeting a standard attack. This means that we're computing over one byte position of AES, all samples of a trace, and all traces in a data set. The insight that we get in here are that SNR and TVLA algorithms are very I.O. bound. As you can see, this 13 second time is actually pretty much just the read time for the data set. The TBLA, since it's computing over two trace sets, is reduced as it is about half the data and we're doing a parallel read. So for the, I'm oh sorry, half the data for two trace sets and they're reading at the same time. Uh, the CPA is again very bound by memory bandwidth. This means that it has a high variety in system to system performance based on the specifications of the chip that you're using. And SCAR is extremely fast over compressed data. As you can see here, it is as fast, if not faster, compared to uncompressed for all of the algorithms that we're listing. And SCARED shows very poor performance when using compression. As you can see for the SNR, is about six times slower when using a compressed data set compared to uncompressed. An important thing to note for these benchmarks is that due to graph scaling, we had to restrict our MIA computation to only 5,000 sample points. This was so that we didn't show you just a very tall bar of just the MIA. It is much more compute heavy. Uh, this also limits the impact and benefit of the compression that you see here. This is our second profile. Now this is targeting a known key extraction. This means that we upped the number of byte positions for AES up to 16. The insights that we gained from this is that our scaling was in line with our first profile and that the increased computation requirements of doing 16 byte positions actually lessens the impact of compression in SCARED. As you can see now, they are only about a one to two ratio for uncompressed to compressed performance. Now, for this system, our compressed SNR is actually slower here in SCAR. This is not necessarily the case for every system, which I will so show you in just a moment. Now, this is the third profile. This is targeting a trace of interest selection. Now, this means that we've lowered the byte positions again back down to one, but we are now computing over every second trace in the data set. The insight that we gained here is that duration was actually not reduced by one half. Due to the increased I.O. complexity, the run times have actually increased a lot in most cases. And that SCARED is suffering heavily from trace indexing here. As you can see, their times are much greater than that of the first profile. While LASCAR and SCAR are now performing about the same, LASCAR was actually the only framework to show a reduction in time on their SNR algorithm due to the trace indexing. We also like to note that uh, due to our use of asyncio, this is why indexing is not much of an issue in SCAR. Here's a system consistent comparison that is covering SCAR only. Now the systems that we use here were an 11th generation Intel CPU laptop, a Intel Xeon server, an Apple laptop with an M3 chip, as well as a Threadripper system. As you can see here for the first profile, there are diminishing returns of faster CPUs. As you can see for our SNR, both the 11th generation Intel chip as well as the Threadripper are both running in 13 seconds. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense if this is a compute bound problem, as once again, this 13 seconds is pretty much just our read times. Well, for the second thro profile, the Threadripper 7995WX is crushing the competition, proving our compression benefits. Again, if you look at the SNR result here, you can see that the time goes from 19 seconds on an uncompressed data set to actually 13 seconds over compression, which is about a 30% gain for something that also benefits you by saving your disk space. The analysis that we just showed you led us to make a buyer's guide to make your side channel analysis experience faster. We recommend two groups of processors, the first being the hacker's choice, which is good for our first profile that we showed you. This is where you're going to want something like a Ryzen 9 7950X.
X or a Ryzen 9 9950X. We also present the evaluator's choice, which is good for the second profile. This is where you want something like a Threadripper Pro 7995WX. Additionally, you should try to avoid NUMA architectures, use fast, low latency memory, and use fast SSDs. We were unfortunately not paid by AMD to present this information to you today, but we are looking forward to see how they compare against 15th generation Intel CPUs. SCAR also has some remaining limitations that we would like to address. We would like to optimize low-level read operations. Currently, ZAR's use of FDAR read is failing to saturate the SSD bandwidth fully. We think it may be better to read using the IO Yearing library to asynchronously queue all chunks of our data set. Also, currently, our async yield prefetcher is not working if our compute burden is less than our IO burden. But I think the results that we're showing you here today are good enough that we don't really have to worry about that right now. We would also like to investigate parallelizing some of our algorithms on the GPU instead of the CPU. Our use of Numba does support CUDA for GPU parallelization, but what is missing with this implementation is that we would have to then decompress the data inside the CPU, do the limitations of ZAR, and then pass that data to the GPU. This would be very slow, and clearly not all of our workloads would benefit. The SNR and TBLA, as we just showed you, are very I.O. bound, but it could help if we did the matrix multiplication for CPA, for example, or the histogram building for MIA inside of a GPU could see to some runtime improvements. There are also many ZAR and Python improvements coming soon. The new ZAR v3 version includes more built-in async functionality and a feature called shard, which we're hoping will decrease our read times. Also, Python 3.12 improves our async yield performance up to about 75%. We have just begun testing this in SCAR, and uh, as a little hint, it greatly decreases the MIA runtimes, as I said, uh, since its compute burden is so high, we do benefit greatly from our async prefetcher. Additionally, there is an optimized ZAR Rust implementation expected. This has been working on someone named Jack Kelly, and we are hoping that they are going to use the IO Yearing library so we can talk about uh, seeing if those optimized low-level read operations will benefit us, as we suspect. We've also made many improvements to SCAR since our paper submission. We have earned the Chess Artifact Badge Artifacts Functional, with our reviewer B concluding that the results are consistent with the ones that we presented in our paper. They tested on a Threadripper 3990X, and we thank them for testing for full reproducibility of our results. We have also added two new leakage detection algorithms, a chi-square test and a deep learning leakage assessment. On top of this, we added some of absolute differences trace alignment, as well as many minor improvements such as refactoring and documentation. This has allowed us to make the bold move to increase our version counter to 0 0.0.2, and we are hoping for community support and funding to continue our development. Until then, I'm just running out my coffee. I'm sure by now you're asking, how can you yourself use SCAR? Well, SCAR is open source under Mozilla Public License 2.0. This means that SCAR cannot be combined with GPL, but we are following a simple inbound equals outbound contribution model, just like Ghidra. And we are aiming for a fair compromise of different needs here for academia, industry, and government. We would like everybody to use our tool if possible. As you can see here, we have a main repository that you can install via pip, and also a secondary repository where you can find examples of how to use SCAR's code yourself in many Jupyter notebooks. Today, we demonstrated that compression is highly advantageous for 12-bit ADC data, that SCAR has native support of EM tiles, only one other open source project supports this currently, that SCAR has excellent real-world performance using a feature-rich file format, and on a personal note, I had a great learning experience as an undergrad. For our future work, we would like to further improve our code base, refactor, and extend our algorithm support, as well as turning SCAR into an active community-backed open source project. I'm extremely grateful to be here today. A huge thanks to my chess sponsors, NSF, and all my co-authors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, do we have any questions here? Uh, thank you for your talk and for this uh, interesting subject not so often uh, uh, considered in uh, research papers. Um, my question is, uh, is it possible to tweak your, um, your file format to, for instance, for every operation where I record uh, the side channel activity, uh, like, for instance, I want to record several side channels, let's say the power consumption, the electronic emanations, you know, 
And let's say, for instance, one is in on 8 bits and the other is on 12 bits. Is it possible to tweak or to, you know, to, to build something on top of your proposal? Uh, I think that would be possible. Um, similar to HDF5, um, czar, you can have like um, multiple data types. I think that you may have to have uh, multiple trace sets in this example, but uh, we do obviously also support multiple trace sets for TVLA already. Um, so I, I do think that this was possible, but it would probably take a, a pull request or two to get it implemented properly and fast. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, I think we have time for two questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, are you planning to compare uh, the performance results that you showed previously with some Rust-based tools that exist for the moment? Because we already replaced Lascar with uh, Muscat, which is a Rust-based tool. Uh, yeah, as I showed earlier, since this is an I.O. bound problem, I really do not believe that you would see much performance gain for out-of-core computing currently due to read limitations uh, using a language such as Rust. Um, however, I do have, if I can, I have a slide here where we, we showed the performance of uh, SCA lib, and um, unfortunately, uh, if you do not use their NumPy format, it's uh, about the same performance as Scared, I would say. But um, if you uh, use NumPy, like uh, on, for their SNR, it's like uh, 14 gigabytes of memory requirement, where uh, uh, SCAR is only like 120 megabytes. Um, so, really, it's just a it's a give and take in those scenarios. There, Rust is much faster if you're reading the entire data set into memory if you are able to do that. But otherwise, um, uh, Python seems to work just fine. Yep. Thank you. Which is not working. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Um, you mentioned on one of the last slides that you added, I think, uh, 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 some form of alignment. Have you considered other algorithms that are more like in the direction of either signal processing or alignment, like correlation FFT-based alignment or, uh, I don't know, band pass filters or these kind of things? Because I can imagine in for a real attack in black box scenario, you want to run everything maybe like First filtering, then alignment, then maybe apply to original traces. So, is it in your? Uh, are you planning to 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 work on that, or do you consider it, or do you think it's easy to extend? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so, so we have had we've added some basic uh, data filtering to like uh, normalize your data set into Z scores currently, um, and we would like to investigate doing something like a time dynamic time warping for alignment. We think would be great to add. Um, currently, there are some limitations at that. It would take a, I'm uh, currently just working on this on my free time as I work in industry, so it's a little uh, hard to find the time sometimes, but I'm currently hoping to also add pre-processes, or uh, pre-processes from my perspective, I'm a software guy, but post-processes as most people refer to them, um, such as like a PCA component kind of thing, but uh, that's still a work in progress, but we do have plans to add that functionality. And, and do you think that it would be hard to get into the topic and, for example, try to add my own alignment? Or do you think, like, how you, like, just your feeling-wise? Or it's hard to answer? So, um, currently, I think that it, it would be hard to add. But once I add the initial pre-process, the same as, like, we have model values, we are designing in a way where it is very easy for users to pull down and then just add one of the same objects, and then it, it should be very easy once we get the initial part added. Thank you very much. It was super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, let's thank the speaker again. OK, yeah, the next talk is given by Colin about phase modulation side channels, jittery JTAG um, for on-chip voltage measurements. Thank you very much, um, and not the session chair, the session chair. I forgot to, to tell everyone at the opening remarks, there's aisle microphones as well, so you don't have to run around as much if, if people are willing to move. <laughs> yeah, but if you like to, so be it. 
Um, so thanks very much for, for um, attending my talk. So this talk will be a bit about phase modulation um, for side channel measurement. So quick two second summary. I know there's three, s oh. maybe did this thing stop working? Quick summary of this, um, two, select it, two slide summary, um, is something like this. So there was a really great work um, in last year called JIT SCA. So basically when I saw this, this was like, oh, this is amazing. Um, that looked at this idea that if you have a um, phase shift within a digital signal, this is actually a really easy way of measuring the leakage. Um, and when you look at systems, there's a lot of digital signals that could potentially have this phase shift available in it. Um, so I ex extended this using optical isolators. So there's kind of a bit of a recreation proving section. Um, so to add some additional isolation technology testing. Um, and the second part of the paper, and also then there was this point that um, in CHES 2002, there's a paper talking about angle modulation, which is basically another name for phase modulation. Um, so it's also looking a bit at the, the history of, you know, where I think some of this came from. Um, the second part of the paper uses JTAG. So looking at JTAG, very, you know, ubiquitous interface on digital devices um, and how we can force a signal across that to actually get phase modulation data out of a chip um, with purely digital connections. Um, okay, so that's the, the quick summary of it. So more details. Um, first, some quick side channel timelines. Um, and one of the points of this is that there may still be more side channels out there. This was kind of the amazing thing about JIT SCA is that, um, you know, you look at shunt resistors, 1999, EM probes, 2001. And, and I, I mostly included papers that show kind of an exploitable leakage where a key recovery is done. There's some other papers that are missing. This is a, a quick timeline of, you know, relevant to the work I'm showing. Um, IO pin leakage, photonic emission, um, noise of capacitors has been shown, you have static power analysis, thermal leakage, um, Firefield RF and EM, so you know this Firefield RF EM where the leakage is coupling onto a transmitted RF signal, um, impedance measurement, and then jitter measurement. So you have these you know 20 plus years of different side channels used to, to measure things. Um, and these were just the papers. So yeah, it, it, to me it was quite amazing that you had this, um, these new techniques coming out still. Um, so very quickly, JIT SCA that this is built on. Um, I didn't look at the authors here too. I only say good things about the paper, so it's safe. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, it showed that you, you could ha basically have this jitter on one device um, that's transmitted, they tested over a galvanic isolator um, to a receiving device. Uh, and the jitter is basically inherently coupled into your devices because if you have a device like this with crypto, you know, running off um, the same v, uh, power pin or power rail or internal power as basically any sort of digital signal. So you have a buffer signal, you have some registers. If there's a digital signal going through that, um, you end up with jitter being coupled onto that signal. And that jitter comes from variations in the power supply um, that are coupled, you know, into that buffer circuit. And it's even, the, the thing is too, it, because it's not just um, register based, it happens with all IO pass through. There's sort of two different effects here. One effect is um, jitter coming from the voltage changing on the chip itself. The other is that you get jitter from the threshold level changes. So even if you just pass it through a buffer pin, um, there's still some jitter that's added because the threshold um, of this buffer is actually being modulated or changing with the, the power supply. So um, there, there's some more details in the paper and all this I'm kind of going through pretty quickly, but the idea is here, right, as this threshold changes, it translates into a, a changing time. Um, so this is one of two different ways you get this, this um, jitter. And so basically jitter is another name. Jitter and phase modulation are effectively the same thing. Phase modulation on the right, um, I'm showing a easier to understand binary phase shift keen where there's only two valid phases for the carrier wave to be in. So you can see these sudden shifts. 
Um, we can also have analog phase modulation. So with analog phase modulation, um, we just have, you know, whatever shift, there's no discrete steps, it's just shifts in the phase relative to some carrier. So this looks a lot like jitter. Jitter's bad, phase modulation's good is basically what it comes down to. Um, and the name angle modulation refers to the fact that if we were looking at this as a vector, the vector would have an angle. So instead of calling it phase modulation, you can also call it angle modulation. Um, so, and yeah, in Ches 2002, uh, this was also mentioned as something that was tested. It was tested more under an EM probe setting, but I mean, the, the point of the, the modulation existing is still there. Okay, so that's the idea of phase modulation, phase measurement. How do we measure it? Um, so in JIT SCA, a time to digital converter is used. Um, that's not the only way. There's, there's a few different ways to measure phase. Um, you can XOR if it's purely digital. Um, you can XOR together a reference signal um, and the jittery signal. This is used in like a phase detector if you have phase lock loop blocks. Um, and the final one is an analog mixer. So this is what I use mostly in my work. Um, we'll talk a bit about the XOR. So the other point was showing different ways of doing the measurement. Um, this is interesting because uh, when you look at the implementation, it basically runs with existing hardware. So it uses the ADC to actually measure the phase. Um, so your measurement setup is very similar. So it's very easy to compare. The other point of this work is that we can compare a shunt-based leakage and phase modulation leakage very easily. All right, so RF mixers um, also, you know, they, they have existed for a while in old tech. Um, so the idea of them is, is quickly you have two signals, an input signal, uh, what would you call a local oscillator, LO. Um, these signals get mixed together. In the frequency domain, it gives you an output that would be the addition and subtraction of the frequencies. Um, so normally this is used to downshift, right? So you have your whatever gigahertz input um, RF signal, you downshift it to some intermediate frequency to do some filtering um, or processing, and you may have another mixer to downshift again. Um, and then you upshift if you need to transmit at a different frequency. So they're no, mostly used in RF um, transmitters would be the typical thing. But they also work as a phase measurement. Um, so this is from an app note showing that basically as the phase difference, if you put the same frequency into both sides with different phases, you get a voltage that um, indicates the phase. Um, and the physical mixer, what they look like, so it's not this big vacuum tube thing, this isn't my side channel solution. Um, this little surface mount part in the top right corner. Um, so there's, there's some design information that's all available, all open by the way. Um, but yeah, this tiny little thing in the corner is the physical mixer. So it has, um, you know, the same port. So it has an input port, a local oscillator port, and an output port. Um, so the setup looks like this for the first part of the work. Uh, basically what you have is you have a target here um, this target has an internal oscillator on it. Um, so this isn't the internal oscillator and a microcontroller, which will be my reference. Um, I'm using purely the internal microcontroller oscillator, which is not perfect, um, which will come into play later. Um, this signal, so for my first test, I basically take that, pass it through the PLL inside the, the chip and just pass it out an output. So it's like I'm using the reference frequency from the device. And the assumption here is that because that PLL is on the same die as the core, it's going to couple some leakage onto that PLL, that clock output signal. Um, to avoid having a separate reference trace run, which I wouldn't have because this is an internal oscillator, so I'm trying to take sort of the most extreme case. Um, what I do here is there's a second PLL. I'm using a Chip Whisperer Husky, which has a PLL inside it. This basically cleans up your, your jitter. So one of the things PLLs do is they filter um, the jitter away. That's a common use of them. So this basically gives me a signal without the jitter. So I get a cleaned up signal that's from the target. I then compare the two of them, and that's my phase information. And so the output there is the phase that I can then measure. Um, so all I have is one single signal coming from the device, and then I'm able to do this measurement. So physically, it looks like this. Um, so there's two different test setups. This has an IC isolator board. Um, so this was kind of more closely recreating JIT SCA. 
The second phase uses uh, optical isolators. So you can see the target board on the right side is battery powered. You can put like 10 meters between them to do this. So there should be no signals, right, except the digital signals from these optical isolators. Um, and the optical isolators themselves are discrete isolator devices that give you TTL in and out. So they're, they're you know, should have no coupling, um, although that's also tested as part of the paper, that it's purely digital signals coming here. Okay, so what does it look like? So visually, this is not scientific, but it looks cooler, is the shunt resistor on the right is your, you know, normal part of AES. This is all AES is what I'm using. So part of AES, so you see, you know, some different structure. On the left is the output of my mixer. These are both average, um, but you can see there's a very strong structure. So it looks, you know, very much like there is leakage. Um, and of course, that's, as I said, not scientific, but if you look at the actual results, what you see is um, to go down to a partial guessing entropy of zero, so full key recovery on a CPA attack, um, it's about 750 traces with the shunt resistor and only about 2,775 with this purely digital optical pass. So the results are, um, I thought, surprisingly good for this digital leakage measurement. Um, so you now have a, a method that's not using the shunt resistor at all, is purely using my optical isolator, um, and we get these, you know, very common attacks. And it's a standard CPA attack, Hamming weight leakage, no pre-processing done, um, anything like that. So it's a very just off-the-shelf, hit-the-button attack. Um, as I said, I did test, so there was work um, in 2010 on I.O. leakage, so just connecting, you know, if the I.O. pin's high or low, does this give you leakage? Um, and this will come into play for the JTAG testing later. And this is was just done with TVLA testing, um, but you can see the results are quite low. The only one that had some, you know, interesting amount is if the I.O. pin is set low, um, which, as I talked about in the paper, maps pretty well to the prior work. Um, when the isolators are in, you can see the TVLA results really drop off, which is what we expected, but it's also trying to prove that the isolators are not leaking analog signals as well. Okay, and I highlight it. Um, all right, so why this is interesting to me is phase measurement as a threat model, you only require a digital connection. Um, you have tools, like the, this is an ECU tuning tool, there's a whole bunch of them, where they, they sell these tools, and basically it's, hey, you plug this into a port on the ECU and it's reprogramming it. Um, you know, there, there's a few different tools like this, where if you can make it so a user just needs to plug in and doesn't need to understand an EM setup or things like that, um, I'm arguing that it could be more interesting. The other point is that um, there's a lot of digital signals on devices. So like, you know, an SD card is really handy because that's often an exposed port. The SD card has signals, clock signals generated by the micro, con the, you know, target. You can do things like force the um, SD card host to keep polling and things like that. So um, there's a lot of attack vectors that open up. All right, so that's the kind of idea of phase modulation um, as a leakage. The other part of it is that, um, you know, once again, we have JTAG as an attack. And I say once again because it feels like there's so much on JTAG, um, and, and this seems like it was sort of a, a missed opportunity in terms of prior uh, work. Because once you start thinking, you know, hey, if you have this phase modulation, this is a really great interface to, to do this type of work on. Um, and the reason it's so good is this is like your JTAG tap sort of standard diagram showing the setup. Um, you don't really need to care about anything except there's a test data in, TDI, and a test data out. There's a few different paths you can normally select between depending on the state. One of those paths is called the bypass, and this just has a one-bit register between the input and output. Um, so you basically now have a setup where I can force a clock across a device, um, through the device, out the bypass, out the TDO, and use that to measure the phase. And I can do this at pretty high speeds, um, and it works pretty well. So the setup now looks like this. Um, there's a, on the left, is sort of my measurement setup. So I, I set a clock into the TCK pin, so I just have a clock going to clock data in. Um, I send half that frequency in as the test data in, so it's just always toggling high and low on the output, and then that TDO pin is my phase measurement. So I can compare the data I sent in, the data I sent out, and then get a delta of how much, you know, phase has been added or changed um, by running it through the device. Okay, so it looks like this. Um, 
you'll notice very importantly there is no isolators here. So there's no isolators because JTAG should be a better attack than just measuring the IO pin leakage. So if I had the isolator, it's a bit of a cheat because you could say, well, what if you know the IO pin was leaking or things like that? So I'm trying to include that leakage in any potential measurement. Okay, so the results here, so it's a tiny bit worse. Um, the shunt resistor, the shunt resistor here is taking more traces. Uh, the clock's running at a different frequency than, than the previous one. And I have the JTAG clock toggling here, so it's a fair comparison. Um, basically, you can see it you know, goes from 18, 1,800 traces to you know, almost 9,000 traces. Um, importantly, if I stop, if I keep everything the same and stop toggling um, that pin, you can see there's no successful attack and the TVLA result is very poor, um, which means there's little or no IO pin leakage. So m all this leakage is coming from me running a clock through and measuring the phase at the output. Um, and again, this is just a standard sort of attack. Um, the other point is that you can run uh, JTAG a lot faster than they claim. So um, most of the devices will spec, okay, the JTAG works at 10 megahertz, maybe 50 megahertz, um, or Xilinx had 66, something, you know, there's some specified debug frequency that's normally not that fast because most debug probes won't work that fast. Um, and they're, you know, of course, specifying the entire, when I had this JTAG diagram, there's a lot of other states that I'm not using. So if all we use is the bypass register, what we discover is that the, um, the JTAG clock can run much faster. So here you can see a lot of these devices were running up to 200 megahertz, which means I can do the IO sampling at a much faster rate. So the interesting thing is right, I could run the JTAG faster than the core. The JTAG's totally separated from the core, of course, so it also doesn't depend on the core frequency. Um, the other part of this JTAG work of this paper was tying together that um, there's some really great work on fault and injection um, and fault injection correlation analysis. So this wasn't the first paper on it, but the first paper that had um, a lot of work specifically showing that fault injection can be used as an oscilloscope effectively. So um, the way this works is we basically take the same setup and what I'm doing now is um, I don't do a phase measurement. Basically what we do is depending on the voltage change, right, the input um, location where it's sampling will shift as well as the chance that the registers you know are sampling the wrong data or going to metastable state or anything like that so as the voltage changes um, we'll actually see faults on the output if we adjust we adjust the input phase a little bit right for when that um, tdi and tck transition is happening and we get it to a point that we start getting faults um, we can actually turn that into an oscilloscope too so it's not as effective but this required um, no analog measurement at all. So this was done all with the logic analyzer. So Chip Whisper Husky had it built in, but a purely digital measurement as well. So um, the traces look like on the left. So this is a zoomed in part of that little green zone on the bottom there. Um, so what you can see is that, you know, the traces look just like you either get one or zero out. And what you're seeing is you're seeing the number of faults um, that are occurring effectively, or and it's not really a fault. It's more like a mistimed um, sample. If I average a bunch of those, so here I average 10,000 or 100,000, um, what you get is a waveform that looks a lot like a power trace, um, and you just push that data, so not the average data, I just push the raw, you know, one zeros through a CPA attack, and you get results that are, they take more traces, so here you can say it's about 86,000 um, or 41,000, depending on two different clock modes I can use, um, but the point is that it worked pretty well. Right, and this was with a purely digital, so the interesting thing is here, of course, right, all I needed to know was the state of that output, that one or zero pin. Um, so if I could measure a digital output, then I'm actually able to do this as well. All right, so what about countermeasures? Um, the best countermeasure is to not have JTAG on. So some devices, STM devices, um, and I talk more in the paper, you can just kill the JTAG fully. You can get it back with fault injection outside of the scope of the paper. Um, but a lot of devices, you cannot disable boundary scan mode because it's used for testing, it's used for PCB verification. Um, so even if you lock the device down, boundary scan is always on. So there's several devices, it's very common that boundary scan's enabled, even if, um, yeah, the, you have it in some secure mode. So that's the other interesting thing is there's a, 
potential to do this measurement on devices that might leave the JTAG port physically available because they've disabled it on the device, they think, but there's still some very basic functionality, which is all we need. Um, I do test in the paper some other countermeasures that are, you know, th these are sort of engineering level, so basically resampling the signals um, so that you lose the coupling of the jitter to the measurement on the device. So I have a really simple ICE-40 FPGA where I run the signals through a resampler and it kills the leakage. Um, obviously the better, you know, best would be to kill this. Better would also be to have mast or any sort of protected AES. Um, you know, as I talked about in the paper, this side channel, if you could physically measure the power on the chip, the side channel is irrelevant anyway. So um, at that point, you should have a mast implementation or something. It's very limited to the, the point is that if you need to productize it or things like that, it's relevant. Um, yeah, and if you wanted to resist the um, ability to do fault injection, then you'd also need something like this on the input um, as well. So yeah, that's kind of the summary. Um, so it's a really interesting leakage technique. You know, it dates back to almost the start of Chess, but it wasn't until last year that someone made the proof that this is a great way of measuring leakage. And I'm trying to continue that to show some very practical applications of it um, and also some link to fault injection analysis. Um, there's a few different measurement techniques I explored as well, two different measurement techniques in the paper, the mixor and XOR, um, and driving signals across devices. So don't think it's purely a passive technique that you need. Um, but with that, if there's questions, um, there's a, all the notebooks and everything that are available. I have a full data set that will recreate everything that's in the paper. Um, so if you want to do other analysis, feel free to do so. There's like 300 and some gigs of data when you extract it. So thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? Yeah, it's a wonderful talk. So it's like my teaching my course analog communications. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, uh, uh, for example, for countermeasure, uh, like those AES already is a protected uh, implementation. Is this also applicable? Because mm. I think it is. Yeah, so if it had a protected AES implementation, it wouldn't be because uh, presumably it's the same leakage. So what, what I was testing anyway is that it's the same leakage you would get basically with a power measurement. So if it's protected from EM or power sort of measurement techniques, then this shouldn't be a new leakage. Um, but if it's an unprotected implementation, then it would be applicable. So you think if that's a protected implementation, then your jitter uh, measurements cannot be work? Not the way I've done it. So there, I know there is other work questioning, and this is more like a jitter, there's sort of a separate part, which is you can get jitter leakage due to instruction path differences. So if there's some instruction difference due to the protection that's causing leakage or a memory pattern access, you could actually get sort of another source of jitter. Yeah, I think I what think I'm talking about mm -hmm. shouldn't cause leakage if it's a protected implementation. But I haven't tested that, so oh, okay. but that's why I'm very vague. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Colin, for the nice talk. Uh, the way that you exploited Jitter is very similar to dynamic power analysis. Have you tried to see if there is a static leakage in Jitter? Like no, I haven't. This is okay. Keep that for your own paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's thank Colin again. Thank you very much. Okay, and yeah, the next talk is uh, given by three about the one load sensor detecting FPGA voltage fluctuations using lookup tables. So yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, this talk is titled uh, One Load Sensor Detecting FPGA Voltage Fluctu Fluctuations Using Lookup Tables. Uh, the, the work was uh, primarily done by, uh, by my postdoc, my uh, ex-PhD student and, and, and myself, 
uh, Darshan Daisinger, Brian Udugama, and, and myself. Um, so what you're going to show you today is a very small on-chip sensor, probably the smallest one that I know of, um, which can be executed at, at quite high speeds uh, compared to the previous one. So it's essentially a replacement for TVCs that, that was just mentioned a, a minute, uh, uh, about half an hour ago. So typically um, what we have is we have a, a victim and then there's an on-chip sensor and the adversary gets the data from the on-chip sensor. Uh, and of course the cryptographic circuits, typically an AES circuit that runs at um, usually no mu not much faster than 20, 30 megahertz on a, on a FPGA. Um, so on-chip sensors uh, outputs of course change due to fluctuations. Uh, jitter was one of the fluctuations. In this case, we are talking about power. And on-chip uh, sensors use delay lines to sense voltage fluctuations, right? Uh, there are a number of different types of um, uh, uh, on-chip sensors, uh, time to digital converters, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And I'll, I'll go through some of these things due to time. I'll, 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 I'll quickly run through. So there are TDC sensors. Um, I don't know whether you can see this. Oops, sorry. Uh, the TDC sensors, which are a, a long line of buffers, if you like, which capture, and then there's latches that capture data. The, the red ones are the latches that capture data. And then, of course, there's um, uh, ring oscillators, which use Johnson counters to count the number of times, um, the, the number of uh, oscillations, uh, how much power is being uh, consumed. So it sort of goes round and round adding the number of times, and the Johnson counter counts the number of times. So if, if the power consumption is high on the chip, then the number of uh, oscillations are, are less. And if the power consumption is low, it, it runs uh, a, lot, a little bit faster. Go. Um, then there was a VT sensor, which only used um, four registers or four uh, flip-flops and this is much smaller than uh, a TDC sensor and this was able to pick up data uh, power consumption and and was as effective as TDC sensors but was a lot smaller than TDC sensors. Um, this was published two years ago I think at CHESS or maybe three years ago at CHESS. And then there was a PPWM sensor which is even smaller, had just one flip-flop. One, one of the things that was found was in, with VT sensors, the, the previous one, only one bit was changing. So we thought, okay, we could actually do this with one, one bit. And if one bit change can, can pick the data uh, or pick, pick the key, then that's sufficient. So with one bit, essentially the way it worked was we had, or, or the, the, the designers had uh, two different paths. Uh, both of these things, the delays can be changed. Um, and as long as there was, the, the flip-flop was changing values from zero to one or one to zero, then we knew that we were able to capture the data and we could change the delays until we could get this one to zero, zero to one transitions happening. And then using that data, you could actually capture the key. This is also published, I think, last year or year before. At chess. Um, okay, there, are, there was another one from EPFL, uh, which was a, a, a RDS sensor, uh, which had a, a lot of uh, sensors on chip. Uh, it's quite large, but it's reasonably fast. They were able to pick up at 50 megahertz, um, and, and we were able to make this work reasonably well. Um, the one LUT sen sensor, is a little bit different. It uses um, the, the configurable logic blocks, or CLBs, inside the chip. And each of those CLBs have uh, four LUTs. We are going to use just one of the LUTs, right? And in, those, in that one LUT, we have, uh, uh, on the left-hand side in yellow, we have the, the lookup table, then there's a path, and then there is a, a, a flip-flop on the right-hand side. Now. The interesting problem, the previous one, we could change the delay on two paths. Here, the 
the delays are reasonably fixed, or at least it looks like the delays are fixed. The important thing is to try and see whether we can change the delay on this uh, so that we can capture the data or capture the power variations. Um, so what essentially the underlying idea is, we put a clock, sense, clock input in, and if we can clear the flip-flop, right, as long as there is a, a path differential between these two uh, data, uh, between these, you know, the, the two arrows, the time difference between the two arrows, if there is sufficient depth, sufficient difference, we are going to get, uh, the, the, the flip-flop is going to clear, otherwise the flip-flop will stay, stay as one. Um, so, just to give you an idea of uh, how this works, uh, we add uh, an, 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 on an, sorry, an adjustable clock delay there, that is to use an, an I.O. delay that is available on, on a typical FPGAs. And if we keep, I mean, uh, this, so, if, so the date, this goes a little bit, uh, if it goes quickly, it's, it works well. But if it doesn't, then it, it sort of flips at um, the, 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 the flip-flop clears. Uh, that just gives you some different timings. Essentially, there's no setup time. If it doesn't capture the setup time for that signal, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't flip. Otherwise, it flips. So it's just, just enough to get the data, if you like. Um, the important problem is now, how do we use the LUT to change the delay so that we can capture it? That, that was a, a challenge, right? So let's take a look at what we can do. Um, the SRAM LUTs that are in the chip are, are constructed using uh, memories with sort of multiplexes, if you like. You can think of them as multiplexes. So if you do have multiplexes, let's take a, uh, typically in, in say, Xilinx FPGS, there's a six input um, or, or six uh, uh, level FPGA, but let's just take three input FPGA for the, for the moment, okay? I0, um, I1, and, and uh, so I1 and I2. So if you have, if you take a look at this, right, if you only want, um, so input 000 will go to R0, right? Input 001 will go to R1 and so forth. And if I can use this, if it, is, if it goes from zero to one, during, if, if my uh, sensor signal is connected to I0, right, it will, as long as I have that, that path, uh, the, during the rising edge from zero to one, one propagates through sort of three multiplexes, if you like, right? So therefore, that delays, if you like, three multiplexes. But if I don't want three multiplexes, and if I want a, 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 a smaller, multi, smaller one, I could change my input, uh, input uh, position, right? So because of this, because it's traveling through three multiplexes, the delay now becomes three multiplexes, right? But if I want to sort of change it at runtime, I could use, I could fix those, I could just use the first one, and that could be my delay line now. So my delay line is changed by using the inputs carefully. By selecting the right input, I can, I can select my delay uh, on, on one of the lines. So that is how I'm going to use the delay line. This is, of course, only a three, three level or three input uh, LUT, but we could theoretically use uh, the, the, the typical Xilinx chips has six inputs. So six inputs are a little bit more difficult. So this one is, you know, sort of has different amounts of uh, delay, right? So typical Xilinx uses six, in, uh, six input LUTs two input select lines to choose input, four inputs connected to the, uh, the signal, and we can adjust uh, delta LUT at runtime. Maximum delay is six muxes, um, minimum is one, one mux, and then you can use two of these to use select lines on the middle, and you can pick any one of these things uh, by cleverly arranging the data. We can actually pick any one of these um, delay lines if you like. 
As far as the clock is concerned, we use um, uh, the, the, the tap delay elements inside available, uh, which are available inside Xilinx. And uh, TDs are widely used in FPGAs to adjust delays in high-speed data signals. These signals are, um, uh, they don't vary with, with temperature and things like that, so it's pretty, pretty stable. Um, and there are lots of slightly different times on different types of chips that you can buy. You, that you can buy. Um, so we can control the delay. We have an eye delay. And then uh, using this, we can change the delay. So now we have a bit like PPWM that we showed, that we showed before. We can change the delays of both of these things. Right, so it's a, uh, as I said, it's process voltage and temperature invariant. Um, the thing is, this now runs at extremely fast speeds. Because this is very, very small, you can run this at 600 megahertz on a typical small FPGA. You start running this at quite fast speeds. Um, typical sensors that have been used before, you know, they usually run at 96 megahertz or something like that. But this one now starts runs at running at uh, quite quite fast speeds. Um, so, if you if you're running a smaller uh, or, or a lower frequency AES circuit, you don't want to. There's a lot of data, so you want to pick up, and and the data sort of varies much slower than the sensor frequency. So you want to if you want to pick the intensity of the data, what you tend to do is to try and uh, use the sensor signal. What you try and do is um, do a sliding window average. It's sort of low pass filtering, if you like. So we can do a, uh, if, you, if you do do that, so if you have, uh, so say this is the, what, what we would, if you just do a raw trace, it looks like this. But if you now, try and do an average, a sliding window with eight samples, it looks like that. And if you do a sli sliding window with eight sa 12 samples, it looks like this. So you can low pass filter it to, to get something decent. Um, and then you can fairly, uh, fairly easily get these things, uh, get the data. So we used a, a digital and Z board at the beginning. Um, we, we tried using the other things as well, just one AES circuit, one tiny sensor, and, and these are the specs that we, uh, that we have. We created 200K traces for each experiment, uh, exp except for the ex uh, experiment 10 that, that's in the paper. And uh, we conducted CPA attacks and calculated the key rank uh, to compare the results. So um, the, some, of, some people are not familiar with key rank, but just to give you an idea, key rank essentially picks up all the uh, key bytes, and it is the lower the better. Okay, so I think am I? What's going on? Okay, so so let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take the sliding window. Even with zero, you can pick it up. Uh, even if this, you know, if you use the raw trace, you can still pick it up fairly well, but it takes a bit of time. But um, as we uh, improve the, the, the sliding window, make it uh, 10 to 12 or 8, around 8, we get reasonably fast. Um, we can get it fairly quickly. So it's about 60, 70,000 traces we can get the data out. Uh, and with frequency, the AES frequency, what was interesting was we could we, the AES implementation that we had had a maximum frequency of 120 megahertz. We could easily pick 120 megahertz. But um, interestingly, the faster the AES, the quicker it was to pick it up as well. Um, so the AES secret key can be revealed within 20,000 key traces uh, when operating at 120 megahertz. But it's, um, uh, we should get some more implementations that are even faster. Uh, so that we can get it, uh, we, can, we should uh, try and do more experiments on that. Um, 
we vary the, the LUT sensor to from 120 megahertz to 600 megahertz, and then these are the uh, these are the uh, results we got. The faster it was, the better it was, because we, with, the, with the sliding average window. But it is continuously coming down, so we just needed more and more traces. But the 600 megahertz one was the, f the best of the lot. Um, we placed it in different parts of the FPGA, so we placed it on different corners. So the AES is running the bottom left corner, the ARM processors on the chip, and then there was you know the placement of different uh, FPGAs, uh, different uh, uh, signal uh, sensors at different parts of the chip, and we were able to get uh, different amount of. Uh, you, you could always pick it up. We can't tell you why some are better than the other, but some places are better than, easier than the others. There's, uh, it might be because of the way the power distribution network is on the chip. Uh, things were different, um, a little bit different. From uh, it, it doesn't seem to say that the nearest one is the best one. It's, it's not always the case, right? Uh, it seems to be somewhat somewhat arbitrary as far as we know, but that might be, uh, there might be other, other reasons for that, which, be, which may be proprietary. Um, uh, uh, so large voltage uh, fluctuations, we duplicated the AES instances um, to incur large voltage fluctuations and, and to, to measure these things, and we were, we were still able to uh, pick this up without too much trouble because what you want what you want to check was if this was large voltage um, fluctuations we might get into trouble uh, because the sensor is not sensitive enough to, or it's just not sensitive enough to pick the differences but b because there's uh, there's sufficient amount of uh, a give we could actually pick pick these up as well noise tolerance we want to check whether it could be noise tolerant so we put a, a, a thousand and two thousand ROs separately. So ROs is ring oscillators just to consume power and running at odd, odd, freq odd, odd, odd frequencies, um, just to, you know, just suddenly to um, absorb the amount of power, and uh, and we were able to, you know, it's it's still coming down. It takes a little longer, but as you can see, the 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 key rank is coming down. That means that at some point we'll be able to pick. The, or pick all the keys, just to give you an idea. Right? The other thing that was interesting was to check what happens when temperature changes. Uh, so we, we uh, change the temperatures um, in, in, in different ways. Uh, one was to sort of keep it steady at the bottom. Then the other one just sort of heat it up used with, a, with a hair dryer and then drop the temperature down fairly quickly. Or just to bring it down to room temperature. The other one was to uh, use a hair dryer to increase the temperature suddenly and then cool it down using some ice in a saucepan on top of it. Right? And then check to see whether we can, um, what happens. And you can actually pick the uh, number of encryption needed. Uh, it's about the same, so you can actually pick these things up again. Um, and, um, just to give you an idea of how good or how bad this is, compared to state-of-the-art on-chip sensors, um, the very first one on the, on the, on the, on the left-hand side is using an oscilloscope. You know, so you actually measure it using an oscilloscope, and that is you know, just under 20,000 to pick this data up. Um, but the yellow one is the one large sensor, so that, that's significantly better than any one of the other um, on-chip sensors that you can get. Uh, at least as far as we, as uh, the experiments, we've, we've repeated this a few times just to check this, and it seems to be that we can actually pick this data up uh, a lot faster than any other uh, sensors that people have used. Um, we can, we want to detect small uh, uh, voltage fluctuations Right, um, uh, so this, this was, uh, the, we used the compact AES circuit, 
used in to test the one large sensor to ability to take small voltage fluctuations. This takes 50 clock cycles, I think, if I am not mistaken. And in this case, it takes, um, it is, uh, it still picks it, but it takes a lot longer. You can, you can see it's coming down. That means that we can start to pick it. Um, in that original paper, they only looked for one key byte, uh, not, not all, all 16 key bytes, I think. So in this one key byte, um, you can see the, the one large sensor picks it up for one key byte, it picks it up faster than the other one. Um, you also put it on a large ultra scale architecture um, and that also we were able to pick the key. Only thing was just to make sure that we can actually pick the key, we put two AAS circuits running identical circuits just so that we can get a slightly more greater power sensor, power uh, amount. These are the overheads, um, different amounts of overhead if you like compared to uh, what has been around. This is also exceptionally fast compared to anything else around. So we demonstrated the deployment of FPGA LUT2. Sense FPGA voltage fluctuations. Um, it runs at around 600 megahertz and it is uh, able to, you know, an adversary can construct small ones. Um, countermeasures would be interesting to look at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. So do you have any questions? Okay, yeah, maybe I have a question. So you compared your one load sensor to all the other on-chip sensors here. Do you know why yours is so much better than the, the other ones? I, so I, we picked it because it's fast. We yeah. Picked, uh, because it's fast, we're able to, we think we're able to get a lot more data per, per clock mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, okay. we could isolate where things are happening a little mm -hmm. bit better. Little bit better. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why we can, we can pick it up faster. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Pick it up better. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank Kay. you. Yeah, then let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, now there will be a coffee break for 30 minutes upstairs. <laughs>